All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. Today we are going to have a discussion about Nella Larson's Quicksand. This will be, well, we started talking about it in the last lecture. We talked about Nella Larson's biography, and we prefaced that with a little survey of the elements of fiction. And now I want to begin a discussion of the text itself, but I also want to provide you with certain context. So what we'll do over the next two lectures is today I will provide a few contexts and then look at some passages from the text itself to see how it exemplifies some of its themes. And then um, in the next lecture, I will continue to do that. I will provide uh, contexts for different passages and chapters and moments in the work that will help you to understand some of what Nella Larson is trying to communicate about her themes. Uh, along the way, as I said, we'll be looking at uh, selections from the text, and I will also be kind of demonstrating some aspects of close reading, the uh, interpretive strategy in which you take a selection from a text and look very closely at how the choice of words, the style, the references uh, embody in a kind of microcosm the themes of the work as a whole. So that's what we'll be doing over the next two lectures. In this lecture, I will be discussing uh, the first two-thirds or three-fourths of the novel, everything up to, I think, chapter 17. But I won't mention, if you haven't finished it in this lecture, I won't mention what happens at the end of the book. This will be sort of spoiler-free. And then in the next lecture, I will definitely be talking about the plot as a whole. So you will want to finish the text by the time of the next lecture. All right, so we already talked about Nella Larson's biography, and we had mentioned that she, like her heroine, her protagonist, Helga Crane, in Quicksand, was of a mixed heritage, that she had a, uh, a Danish mother and a black father. And I wanted to show, uh, just briefly in this slide, the way in which that reflect was reflected in her literary influences, I think very deliberately. I think she was very deliberately trying to reflect the different cultural elements of her background. So what are the main literary influences that critics and literary historians have identified on quicksand? And I'll just go through this briefly because you might not be familiar with these. Uh, but if you if you aren't and you liked quicksand, this can be like the uh, the Amazon.com algorithm. If you liked quicksand, you'll like these other books uh, and should buy them. So I would divide her literary influences on quicksand into three categories. The first is the Scandinavian literature of the late 19th century. So remember that Nella Larsen is partially of Danish heritage. And Scandinavian countries and cultures in general were really coming into their own in the late 19th century. There was a kind of cultural renaissance in countries that had been, um, for, for many economic and political and other reasons that I'm not a huge expert on, but had been somewhat um, kind of uh, culturally non-influential or culturally dormant for most of the 19th century. By the late 19th century, there was this flowering of Scandinavian literature, philosophy, art, culture that kind of took Europe and the United States by storm. And uh, the key figure here is the playwright, the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, who you might have studied in high school. I know that his play A Doll's House is often taught in American high schools still. And his plays often concerned social issues, particularly amid the middle class. And while he was writing about largely the Norwegian middle class, which was kind of a new phenomenon by the late 19th century, as I understand it, uh, he was still speaking to readers throughout Europe and the United States. And he was particularly interested in gender. So for instance, the play A Doll's House, which as I mentioned is still uh, considered a classic and is still widely read and performed and taught, was about a married woman's kind of dissatisfaction in her marriage and her desire to find a life for herself outside what was expected of a, uh, of a woman in 19th century Europe. And so in that way, his plays express a certain kind of radicalism and a reflection of changing cultural mores and cultural standards. And then the other author she was influenced by was a Danish author named Jens Peter Jakobsen, who uh, wrote novels uh, 
that kind of dramatize the crisis of religious belief. This, just the things we were talking about in earlier lectures in this course, the way that in Europe and the United States, uh, within the wake of thinkers like Darwin and Nietzsche, and then later Freud, uh, the idea of a solid religious faith began to be called into question, and he dramatized that very, uh, very readily in his novels. And Nella Larson, we know, is influenced by him. And uh, that might sound strange to you if you haven't finished Quicksand, but religion becomes a very large theme in Quicksand in the final quarter of the novel. Then she was also influenced, I would say, by white American writers who wrote on what was called the international theme. So in the late 19th century, this too became kind of a vogue, and the main figure here is Henry James. And if you read Henry James, you can see, I think, his influence on Nella Larson's style, her kind of verbal style. What these writers, Henry James and, and Edith Wharton, and also in a slightly more experimental way, but she was still writing about it, was Gertrude Stein, who you remember went to live in Europe and lived out most of her life in Europe and, uh, and also wrote novels that considered this theme of Americans in Europe. They were writing about the differences between the U.S. and Europe, usually by showing a fictional character, uh, often a female character, a young woman, who went from America to Europe and was dealing with the differences in culture between the United States and Europe. And often it was contrasting a kind of sense of American innocence with the long history of European society and all the kind of corruptions that had accumulated over that long history. And it was often shown through the, this young female character having to choose whether or not to marry uh, a European man or not. And you can see in the uh, Danish in the Copenhagen episode of Quicksand that Nella Larsen is playing a variation on this theme. However, I think the variation is very much inflected by her experience of being uh, of being African American, of being a, a, a racialized subject, to put it in more theoretical terms. That is to say that uh, this idea of American innocence contrasted with European corruption might sort of work if you subscribe to a kind of ideology that sees America as an innocent country, and that might be easy to believe if you are white, but if you are African American, there's not that sense of America as an innocent country. And so what, well, because why? Well, because of the long history of the oppression of African Americans in the United States. And so what Larson ends up uh, contrasting is really two different forms of corruption, as I think we'll see. Uh, so she is taking that uh, theme from white American authors and showing that what they write about looks very different if seen from a black perspective. And then finally, she's highly influenced by African American literature, particularly of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, not only uh, fiction and poetry by writers like Langston Hughes and Jean Toomer, and we see that this novel has an epigraph. So an epigraph is a quotation introducing a literary work. This novel has an epigraph from Langston Hughes, which you probably noticed. Uh, but also the social and political thought of African-American literature, particularly, I would say, that of W.E.B. Du Bois, who, uh, and we'll look at his influence on the novel in more detail later, so I'm not going to go into it now. But she's definitely influenced by African-American literature and by the kind of surrounding, prevailing culture of the Harlem Renaissance that's all around her as she's writing Quicksand. And much of this uh, novel, uh, the parts of it that are set in Harlem are kind of a reflection on the Harlem Renaissance. So those are some of her influences. And I, I just wanted to show, because this is a class about multiculturalism, that, and I think sometimes people talk about multiculturalism as if there are different cultures and they're self-contained and representatives from one culture will speak and then representatives from another culture will speak. But it's really much more complex than that. And I think that, that Nella Larson's life and work shows that, that multiculturalism is something that often occurs in one person, in one text. She's reflecting the influence of the many cultures that she lived in than that she had access to. So she is, in that sense, a multicultural author, and this is a multicultural text. And I think we'll see that again and again throughout the semester, uh, that almost no 
text we're reading, at least none of the long novels that we're reading in this course, I think are expressive of a single cultural outlook or sensibility. All of them show a meeting, sometimes a clash of cultures. All right, um, a few more uh, points about quicksand by way of introduction before I get into the text itself. I want to talk about the genre of the text. So genres are ways of classifying literary works according to their features. So you take a work of literature or other types of culture and you say what is its form, how is it structured, and what are the things that happen in it, and then you compare it to other works that have similar forms and similar uh, events that are shown within it, and after a while you have enough evidence to, to generalize, to form genres. But one of my theses about literature, one of my philosophies about literature, it's similar to the thing I just said about culture is that just as uh, very few texts that, uh, that are going to interest us in this course are expressive of a single culture or a single cultural sensibility, I also think that the most interesting works of literature often occupy multiple genres at once. That if a work just occupies a single genre, it becomes pretty predictable because you know what the rules of that genre are, and so you know what the end of the book will be when you start it because you can see the machinery of a certain genre being set in motion. I think, <clears throat> I think, excuse me, that the best works kind of exist at the intersections of multiple genres, and I think that's true of quicksand as well. So I want to give you some words, some terms one of which will come back definitely in this course. So one of them is the Bildungsroman. This is a German word, and we're going to learn a French word later in this uh, lecture, so, uh, so hold on. So this is a Bildungsroman, which basically translates to a novel of growth, development, education, or formation. So the word in German, so Roman is just the, the German word for novel. But Bildung is a kind of hard to translate word. It actually relates to, we talked uh, a few lectures ago about how the idea of culture particularly came from Germany. And they saw culture as a process of cultivating the citizen of the nation. And this idea of Bildung, which means growth, development, education, formation, is very closely related to that idea of culture. So you, you become developed, you become more cultured. Um, the word, the origin of the word, I don't really speak German, but I think build in German is picture. And it starts as a religious concept. To, to achieve Bildung is to become like the image of God within you. And then it becomes a secular concept where to become uh, to achieve Bildung is to grow into the image of the perfect citizen that you've internalized. So the Bildungsroman is a novel that shows this development of a person from immaturity, immaturity to maturity, to becoming this good citizen. However, the genre has kind of a, uh, uh, it has a trajectory where initially works in the genre of the buildings roman when this genre was new around the early 19th century the uh the end of the book would be the achievement of this development into a good citizen and maybe the key examples in the english language that maybe people are familiar with maybe uh, whether you've read it or you've seen movie versions are jane austen's novels and jane austen's novels the protagonist the female protagonist the heroine she by the end of the book usually marries a suitable mate for herself and that signals her growth into a full kind of citizen of the society. But by the end of the 19th century there were a lot of examples of what are called failed or late Bildungsroman e. I think that's the plural, Bildungsromani, where the character at the end of the book doesn't really successfully develop into a character who's going to become a productive and good member of society. And maybe the example you might be familiar with, I know this book is, is, all, is often taught in high schools, is Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. You might remember the end of that book. The character's grown up a lot, uh, signaled by his devotion to Jim and his desire to free Jim and to protest against slavery. However, 
by the end of the book he just runs away it's clear that he's not there's no place and there's no role in society he can fill so in that sense that's a failed Bildungsroman and so one of the the pieces of suspense about quicksand I think if you're familiar with the genre of the Bildungsroman is will this be a success or a failure will Helga Crane find a place for herself in society or will she not and I think that you haven't finished the book so I'm not going to spoil it but that's something if you're still reading it think about that as you come to the end of the book is she going to find a, a fulfilling place for herself in her society or any of the societies in which she lives or not. So, sorry, that was a long explanation. I can be briefer with the next two. I think the other two genres are the social novel or novel of manners. So this is a novel that takes as its subject everyday life, usually in the middle class, and very closely analyzes that society by showing characters who occupy different positions and roles in that society showing what kind of people they are. And these kinds of novels are often satirical. They're often making fun of their societies. Again, Jane Austen is a really good example. She was doing this as well. And I think Nella Larson is very much doing it. One of the uh, things you'll see on the next, uh, on a, well, I don't know if it's the next slide, but on a later slide, you will see the structure of the novel. And one of the ways the novel, the, the main way the novel is structured is that Helga Crane goes into very different social spaces. And everywhere she goes, she's kind of an outsider, and so she has this outsider's eye for the way people act in different social classes, different social scenarios, and different social settings. And she has this very sardonic, ironic, uh, sarcastic eye for the kind of hypocrisies or just the, the ludicrous behavior that people do to fit in to certain settings. So this is a social novel or novel of manners. And then finally, I think this is in many ways a modernist novel. In certain ways, it's not. It's not the most dramatic example of a modernist novel I could give you. Uh, some modernist novels, like those of Gertrude Stein, for instance, as you might imagine, having read a poem by her, are very experimental at the level of style. They use stream of consciousness narration, where the narrative voice is just following the character's mind for pages at a time as the mind wanders, or they come up with bizarre linguistic uh, tricks and innovations, as in some of the works of James Joyce, or maybe the most experimental novel of the Harlem Renaissance is Kane, C-A-N-E, by Jean Toomer, which is a mix of prose and poetry uh, that also incorporates passages of drama that has sort of passages that are meant to kind of be read aloud and chanted. It's a much more experimental work at the level of language and structure. However, despite the fact that Quicksand is a little bit more solid, um, in spite of its title, than other experimental modernist novels, I think it has the focus that many modernist novels had on the inner life of the protagonist. So we mentioned psychology and the unconscious mind being a key element of modernist art. I think this is a novel that is laser focused on not just Helga's society, which I mentioned, uh, you know, in relation to this being a novel of manners, but how she perceives her society and how she does or does not internalize the social standards of her society. We are intently dwelling in her mind, in her subjectivity, and in her emotions throughout the novel. And we can see, if, you, if you've read the novel, you'll know. Uh, I hope you've read the novel. It was assigned. Um, if you've read the novel, you'll know that there are many passages where we, the narrator says that Helga uh, felt her body felt hot. She felt flames. Her skin was aflame. So it's not just what she's consciously thinking. That's not only what the narrator directs us to, but these micro analyses of the movement that are beneath Helga's own awareness of her thought and feeling. That's why this novel couldn't be written in the first person and be as interesting as it is, because if Helga told her own story, she might not be as aware of these unconscious movements in her body and in her mind that the third person narrator gives us access to. So modernist novel of consciousness, 
novel of manners and Bildungsroman. And keep, I know Bildungsroman is a long German word, um, but please do keep it in mind because it's going to come back. We're going to read um, at least one more Bildungsroman. I mean, arguably all novels are Bildungsromani, but, uh, but one other novel that will make a big deal about its being a Bildungsroman. So keep that word in mind. All right, one more general uh, observation before we get into some specifics of the text. I want to talk about the literary style and techniques that Nella Larson uses to bring this book to life. I think that uh, I've, I've isolated three. So the first one is a word we saw in the last lecture. I mentioned it when I was running down the list of the elements of fiction, which is focalization. This is when a narrator, so let's back up for a minute. So Quicksand is narrated in the third person, as I just said, and I think for most of its length, it is what I would call third person limited narration. We are almost always in Helga's mind. It's a third person narrator, but that third person narrator is narrating from Helga's position, from Helga's subjectivity. There are passages where the narrator appears to tell us what other people is, are thinking, and I think some of those are passages in which what she's really telling us is what Helga thinks other people are thinking. But there are passages that seem to break out and it becomes briefly omniscient. I don't know that writers, you know, this, these things are of concern to professors and to critics, but writers aren't necessarily trying to follow every rule religiously set down by a writer or critic, and we shouldn't expect them to. So. There might be passages that break out of this third-person limited perspective in which Nella Larson clearly tells us what other characters are thinking, but for the most part, this novel is focalized through Helga Crane. She is our lens. She is the lens through which we focus on the things the novel is about. And Nella Larson also uses another technique that's part of focalization, which is called free indirect discourse. This is a very technical term and it's a very technical subject and I could talk for an hour about it, but I, d I don't want to, to uh, occupy my time with that or <laughs> occupy your time with that. So let me give the briefest definition of free indirect discourse that I can. This is when a third person narrator blends their own language with the language that the characters are using in their mind. So we go from an objective third person narrator to a narrator that is now using the inner language of the character. That sounds abstract, let me give you an example. At the end of one of the chapters, I think it's four or five, when Helga is on the train and she gets a sleeping car in the train and she's drifting off to sleep, we read on page 29, why had she lost her temper and given way to angry half-truths? Angry half-truths. Angry half, and it drifts off. You see what's happened there is we have a third-person narrator that's narrating objectively, but then she goes right into what Helga's thinking. And what's Helga thinking? Helga is ruminating obsessively on her meeting with Dr. Anderson as she's falling asleep. So her mind is kind of circling this topic, angry half-truths, angry half-truths, angry half, and then she goes to sleep. That's free and direct discourse, when the third-person language of the narrator blends with the first-person language of the character. So focalization and free and direct discourse is a major literary style and technique. Another one is what I call circumlocution. So much of this book, or even most of it, is set in, in different versions of polite middle-class society, whether that be the kind of professional middle-class at Naxos, where Helga is working in the South, or the bohemian, cultured, artistic middle-class she meets in Harlem, or the white European middle-class she encounters in Copenhagen, most of the novel is set in some version of a polite middle-class society in which certain things can't be talked about publicly, particularly matters of sexuality and the body. So 
the narrator kind of habituating us to this society, these societies and what they can't discuss use what I call circumlocution. And as that, as the word circle in there indicates, circumlocution means talking around a subject rather than directly talking about it. Euphemism is another word. Euphemism is using a polite term for a uh, subject you're not supposed to discuss in polite society. So again, let me give you an example. On page 16, when Helga is thinking about the kind of house mother of the dorm at Naxos, who's named Miss Magudden, and notice she's a goody two-shoes, so she's named Miss Magudden. There are various satirical techniques like that used in this novel. Helga's thinking about how she's such a prim, uptight, polite person, and she thinks about a rumor she heard about her. And the rumor is this. I'll read to you the passage from page 16. There were, so she had been given to understand, things in the matrimonial state that were of necessity entirely too repulsive for a lady of sensitive and delicate nature to submit to. So what this means, I have to put it impolitely so I can tell you what it means, even though I am also participating in the polite discourse of the academic lecture. What this means is that Helga's heard that this woman wouldn't get married because she thought it was too unladylike ever to have sexual intercourse. And she had, this woman had, Miss McGooden had heard that in marriage you are expected to have sexual intercourse, and so she didn't get married for that reason. So, but the point is, nobody can, can speak that frankly in Naxos. Nobody can speak that frankly in this polite middle-class society. So the novel style takes on this style of circumlocution and euphemism of talking around subjects that are considered too indecent for decent middle-class people to discuss. And then the third style uh, or the third technique I want to look at, and this is one mentioned by the scholar Thaddeus Davis, Thaddeus M. Davis, who writes the introduction to the Penguin Classics edition of Quicksand. And I very much want to recommend that introduction to you. It's very comprehensive, very informative, and very helpful in understanding this novel. And it certainly helped me understand this novel. So if you are reading the Penguin Classics edition that I ordered, I, I do recommend the introduction. So Thaddeus M. Davis mentions that this novel is structured according to again here's a here's another uh, french word well we this we had a german word buildings roman now we'll have a french word and then we have another french word coming up so table vivant these are kind of still lifes the narrative often pauses for long visual descriptions or striking dramatic scenes so we go from these kind of so we go from big moment to big moment to big moment think of we meet Helga. She's uh, in the first uh, chapter. She's sort of sitting alone in this pool of light. And so we get this long description of her almost as if she's the subject of a painting. Then we have other dramatic moments when she often of her being defiant when she tells off Dr. Anderson at her meeting with him in Naxos later in Copenhagen when she refuses the proposal of Axel Olsen. So we go from striking and dramatic scene to striking and dramatic scene. And I've just quoted the first one from the first page. The spot where Helga sat was a small oasis in a desert of darkness. So this is in many ways a complicated novel, but it's also in other ways very simple because we go from setting to setting and in each setting, Helga gets this kind of big, dramatic, operatic moment where she kind of stands out, stands against her background. So tableau vivant. Focalization, circumlocution, tableau vivant, I would say are the three main stylistic and technical tools that Nella Larson uses that are available to a fiction writer to really make this novel vivid and interesting for us. All right, so now I just want to move on to an overview of the book. Uh, this is, uh, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but this is a book structured according to its settings. This is a book that is in many ways an odyssey, a voyage, a journey 
of this protagonist from you know from and to many different places there's a chapter that opens on page 50 i don't remember the number of the chapter seven or eight but it's when she's gone to harlem and she's very happy for a chapter in harlem but you'll notice this is the this is one of the things that happens throughout the novel she goes somewhere and she's happy and fits in for a little while and then for reasons she can't quite even explain to herself she becomes unhappy and finds herself unable to stay. And I think what makes this novel so interesting, and I think what makes it both a social novel and a psychological novel, a novel of inwardness and consciousness, is the following. The thing that makes her unable to stay in each place is partially due to the place itself. She has a, uh, that is Helga Crane and Nella Larson both, have an unerring eye, which by which I mean to say they're never wrong in their observations about what is what is false or oppressive about a certain setting. Everywhere Helga goes, she zeroes in on what is wrong with the place, and she's always right. There's always something wrong, and she's right that it's wrong. And so that in that way, this is a social novel. It's a critique of society, of many different societies because she moves through different ones. However, there's something in her that's never going to be satisfied. Because everywhere she goes, there's people living very happily in the societies that she sees are wrong. So it's not that no one can adjust to these societies. People can and people do, and people in some ways like Helga can and do. There's something about her that's exceptional, that's peculiar, that's unappeasable that makes her unable to stay anywhere. She's this never resting quester for some other way to be. And I think that makes her a, well, both a heroic and an anti-heroic figure for reasons I'll explain at the end of, not today's lecture, but at the end of my lectures on the novel. But what strikes me is this phrase, this sentence, but it didn't last this happiness of Helga Crane's. That's the, that's the principle of the novel. Everywhere she goes, she's happy, but it didn't last, and so she has to go somewhere else. So we can easily divide up the chapters according to their settings. In the first four chapters, she's at Naxos, which is a school in the South for African-American students, a college that is focused on giving them kind of professional skills. And she's unhappy there for reasons we'll examine closely later, but she essentially doesn't think this is a very um, full education for people. She says turning them into machines. So she leaves Naxos and she goes to Chicago, which is where it seems she was raised, where her mother, um, where she lived with her mother as a child. And she goes to see her Uncle Peter and is brutally dismissed by her Uncle Peter because her Uncle Peter is white it's her mother's brother and she's brutally dismissed by his racist new wife and so she gets a job though she's looking for a job in chicago and she gets a job with a woman named mrs hayes Rohr, who's an african-american civil rights activist and speaker essentially and she goes with her to harlem and from chapters 8 to 11 she stays in harlem and she seems that seems like the place that's that's the happiest and it does overall uh, no spoilers, but it does seem like the happiest place she ever goes in the book. And she does fit in for a while there. But there are things in Harlem that also dissatisfy her. So she goes to visit, once she gets a little inheritance from her uncle uh, Robert, did I call him Peter? I think it's Robert. It's, uh, yeah, Robert, sorry. Um, <laughs> she goes there and she gets a small inheritance from her uncle Robert and she goes to Copenhagen to meet other relatives of her mother's and she's happy there for a while but it it turns out that essentially her relatives want to use her because uh, and we'll look closely at this later on but it, the way European racism works is that it treats African Americans as kind of exotic and so they want to use her as their entry into a another sphere of society to which they would otherwise be too boring to have access and they intend to do this by marrying her off to somebody particularly the artist axel olsen and he 
she rejects his proposal and comes back to Harlem. And that's, I think, where you left off reading. So I'm not going to spoil the rest of the book except to say that we have another, uh, another, bre another passage in Harlem and then she later goes to Alabama under what circumstances I'll leave you to discover. So, and these are the, the I, I've provided on this slide illustrations of some of the settings. So my first image is the, I think it's the Tuskegee Institute, which is what the school at Naxos was based on, as I'll explain. Next is Harlem. Then moving down to the bottom left is Copenhagen in the early 20th century. And then I have a picture of a certain setting in Alabama that Helga will go to, but you don't know about it yet, so I won't spoil things. So that's the overall structure of the book. It's structured according to her wandering, her her peregrinations, that's just a bigger word for wandering, through different social settings, all of which she finds what's wrong with, but also for some reasons internal to herself, can't continue to occupy. All right, one more slide of context, and then I want to look at some, passage, uh, some passages exemplifying this context, and then we will move on. So, uh, we wanna, I want to talk about something that was happening in particularly European, but also American culture at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century that I think is a big influence on this novel, which is these are three sort of related contexts uh, aestheticism, flanery, another French word, and orientalism. Because I think to understand these, these things are in the text, but I think they're unspoken. And the reason I think they're unspoken is because Nella Larson is writing in the 1920s to an audience who's living in the 1920s, and she just expects the audience to know about these things because they're part of recent history or contemporary society. And they're, they might, so they're just the kind of the air that Nella Larson and Helga Crane are breathing, but they're maybe not as obvious to a reader coming in later, a reader coming from our time. Helga or Nella Larson just takes for granted that her readers will know about these things and will know the role they play in her novel, whereas I think that we need to kind of study them a little more formally. And this is going to be true of some other contexts I'll introduce later involving ideologies of race and of racism as well. But this has more to do with the arts. So I want to talk about aestheticism, flanery, uh, and orientalism. So aestheticism was a movement that developed in the late 19th century, particularly in France and England, though it didn't later make its way to the United States. It was called the art for art's sake movement, or even more Simply in French, it's l'art pour l'art, which is to say art for art. And what this means is it's very closely related to modernism. We, we talked about how one of the key features of modernism was that it rejected the didactic in art. It rejected the idea that art should have to teach a moral lesson to its readers or viewers. And so modernists embraced and art, a form of art that uh, willfully defied and flouted society's moral rules. And the idea here was that art should exist only for its own sake, for the sake of conveying particular forms of beauty and sensations that were not available in other areas of the culture. So uh, it called for a non-moralist, non-didactic art dedicated simply to the beautiful and often with an undertone of sexual dissidence, by which I mean if the ideal of the 19th century was the nuclear family, a man and a woman should get married and they should produce a certain number of offspring and have their own household. Aestheticism, which was often the creation of um, queer artists, such as Oscar Wilde, for instance, might be a name you might know, that defied that. It was interested in all forms of sexuality that were not sort of considered respectable, normative in the late 19th century. So the first image on my slide here at the, the, the image on the top left is an illustration by an artist named Aubrey Beardsley for one of Oscar Wilde's plays, 
and one of so Oscar Wilde was a um, gay Irish writer from the end of the 19th century who wrote plays and novels and literary criticism and he wrote a play called Salome which was about the biblical figure Salome who did a dance for King Herod to convince him to strike off the head of John the Baptist and in the play Wilde, Oscar Wilde dwells at length on her desire to kiss this this uh, severed head so this this is a form of sexuality that's very much non-normative and in the illustrations Aubrey Beardsley shows her kissing this head um, again to emphasize this you know this act that has no correspondent in conventional morality so aestheticism is one context for the novel I'll explain why in a moment another one is the idea of the flaneur. So a flaneur, this is obviously a French word, was a concept developed by aestheticist and modernist French writers to describe a new type of person that arises in the late 19th century, which is a person largely considered a European man who strolls around the city just looking, just looking at the diversity of this teeming metropolis he's completely detached from it he's in the crowd but he has no connections to anyone in the crowd he's disinterested which doesn't mean bored it means that he doesn't have kind of a partisan role in the crowd he's not a member of the crowd and generally as you can see you had to be of independent means you had to have your own wealth to be this person because otherwise you'd just be part of the crowd hurrying to work or hurrying from work or going to pick up your kids from school or whatever this flaneur has none of those connections it's this independently wealthy unattached male strolling around the city and what's the connection to aestheticism while well, he's casting his eye on everything that passes in the city uh just to see it just for its own interest just for its own beauty not for any personal reason and you can see that this was originally conceived of by european male authors and the flaneur was generally considered to be a european male but i think what quicksand gives us is a black female version of this figure a flaneuse that's the French feminine version of flaneuse, flaneuse. And flanerie is the, this act of walking around the city, flanning around the city. Fla, flan is to, to walk, I think, or to stroll. So in this book, we get, just as uh, Nella Larson rewrote the white novel on the international theme, uh, so she rewrites this European male archetype from an African-American female perspective. Okay, last context is Orientalism. This is something we can go through very quickly because we already saw it with Ezra Pound. This is the broad European interest in and sometimes appropriation of aesthetics and art objects from China, Japan, India, and the Middle East, what was called in the 19th century the Orient. We don't use this term anymore. It's now considered kind of offensive, largely because I think some of this uh, Orientalism was now considered appropriative and offensive. However, it's very much connected to modernism and to aestheticism because once you get rid of the idea that art has to serve a moral purpose, you get rid of the idea that it has to serve a cultural nationalistic purpose, now European artists can become interested in aesthetics from outside of Europe. And on the one hand, this may be appropriative, but it does also expand the range of aesthetics. And we saw that very much with Ezra Pound borrowing forms of Chinese and Japanese poetry uh, from uh, borrowing forms of Chinese and Japanese poetry for his own English language poem in a station of the metro. Look again at the illustration on this slide on the top left by Aubrey Beardsley, and I think you'll clearly see, if you know anything about the history of art, that he's influenced, just as Pound was, by Japanese prints. He's very much influenced by Japanese uh, painting and printmaking. So... What this has to do with quicksand, I'll get to in a moment. But just keep these things in mind. Aestheticism, flanelli, orientalism. And now 
I want to begin actually reading the novel with you, going through some passages that I think exemplify some of the themes of the work. And we'll do that for, well, I started lecturing about 45 minutes ago, so I'll go today for another 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will pick up in the next lecture, and we will look at some more passages and some more themes. All right, so it can be productive to begin a novel at the beginning, though one thing I'll tell you, uh, you're going to write papers in this class, and I'm going to give you a lecture on essay writing uh, soon, is it's often stronger when you're interpreting a work not to simply follow along behind it in chronological order. You want to say, here are the themes I'm interested in, and here are the passages of the work that support my interest in those themes, and then you take passages from all through the text. And that's what I'm going to be doing in this lecture. I'm going to assume you've read the novel. I'm not going to sort of summarize the plot because I think the plot of this book is very straightforward. I'm just going to go through and isolate certain themes and then pick out certain passages from all around the text that illustrate it. That's what you want to do when you're interpreting a novel or, or in fact, a poem. You don't just want to accept the author's structure. You want to impose, well, that's kind of a strong word. You want to, well, why not? It's a strong act. You want to impose your own structure onto it. So that's what I'm going to do. However, I'm going to break that rule just once by beginning at the beginning. So the novel begins with one of these tableau vivant, one of these still lifes. And I just want to read through it. Helga Crane sat alone in her room which at that hour, eight in the evening, was in soft gloom. Only a single reading lamp, dimmed by a great black and red shade, made a pool of light on the blue Chinese carpet, on the bright covers of the books which she had taken down from their long shelves, on the white pages of the opened ones selected, on the shining brass bowl crowded with many colored nasturtiums beside her on the low table, and on the oriental silk which covered the stool at her slim feet. It was a comfortable room, furnished with rare and intensely personal taste, flooded with southern sun in the day, but shadowy just then with the drawn curtains and single shaded light. Large, too, so large that the spot where Helga sat was a small oasis in a desert of darkness and eerily quiet. <clears throat> so I'll stop there. But first of all, one of the things I think that's worth pointing out is how much the narrator tells us about Helga Crane just by telling us how she's decorated her room. And I think that what the narrator is telling us about Helga Crane is that she is an aesthete, a, a believer in aestheticism. We learn that she decorated her own room with rare and intensely personal taste. So she wanted her room to look a certain way. And how did she want it to look? She's very interested in the sort of weird effects you can create with light. So her reading lamp has a black and red shade. So I'd like you to imagine that. Her lamp has a black and red shade. So the light in the room is pretty eerie and weird. It's black and red. And she has a Chinese carpet and oriental silks. So like many aesthetes, she is interested in adopting these Eastern aesthetics, okay? So Helga Crane has this eye for Orientalism, which in many, which will be, I think, ultimately a very tragic irony in this novel for reasons I'll explain, but it's important just that we know it now. She's interested in, you know, floral decoration. She has these many colored flowers and she's a great reader she has a long shelves long shelves plural of books and she's reading a book so she's very educated she's very interested in aesthetics she's very interested in the arts her tastes are orientalist and she sits in this light that's a small oasis in a desert of darkness and i think this idea of helga being alone and isolated with and by her particular artistic sensibility is a key theme that will recur again and again in this novel. This is a novel about, and one of the things we're going to talk about 
is yes, it's a novel about an African American woman and the ways in which those racial and gender ideologies determine her life. But I think before you can understand what's unusual, interesting, and ultimately tragic about the way they determine her life is that you have to understand she as an individual is an esthete. She is primarily interested in seeing the beauty and the strangeness of life and of the world and of her surroundings before she sees or cares about what is socially important or socially relevant. Okay, so Helga as aesthete, as aestheticist, as artistically interested person. That's why do I begin with this? Because it's literally the first thing we're told about her. Okay, we're told that about her before we're told anything about, for instance, her race. We're told she's an aesthete. All right. So that is, uh, that is a first pass at the subject of aestheticism in the novel, an interest in the arts without reference to morality or social meaning or social relevance. This theme does come up again and again in the book. And uh, so, for instance, there's, there's also something I, I haven't really mentioned, and I don't think I have a particular slide for it, which might be symptomatic of my own uh, lapses in judgment and thought, is the following. I mentioned that this is a book about the ways that Helga's gender and race in certain ways determine her life in ways that are very unfair. Um, but it's also a book about, about class and about money. And so Helga, we're told throughout the book that Helga wants money, but she doesn't want it for its own sake. She's not merely greedy. If we had a protagonist who was merely greedy, we wouldn't sympathize with her. We, if she were just, just a crass person who just wanted money and just wanted stuff because she just had this avaricious desire to accumulate stuff, I don't think we, we generally, I don't think readers would find that a particularly sympathetic character. Usually, in most narratives, I think, that foreground the issue of money and class, when characters want money, they want it for some bigger purpose. Even in very simple, like, heist movies, usually the people are trying to steal money. You're told that they, you know, they have a sick kid or something like that, and they need the money. So... Usually when characters want money, we're given some reason beyond money. And so why does Helga want money? She doesn't want money for its own sake. In fact, she recklessly spends money. What does she spend it on? Beautiful things. There's a passage, I think, when she's in Chicago. I don't have it on a slide, but it says she bought a beautiful, expensive purse, and she just had like $5 in it. And I think one of that, that the irony of her life is centered right there. She wants beauty. She wants the aesthetic, which is, again, I'm sorry to repeat this, but I know it's a word you might not totally be familiar with, which is art considered beautiful things, beautiful sensations, beautiful sights, beautiful art considered without reference to society, morality, or any other meaning. That for her is its own value. She pursu pursues beauty as its own value. And that's why she wants money. That's why she wants um, to advance in society. So when she first goes to Copenhagen, it says, I'll just read you this passage. It's when she wakes up in the dolls, the room the dolls have set aside for her. And they seem like people who have money. They just don't quite have the standing they want in society. It was pleasant to wake on that first afternoon after the insisted upon nap with that sensation of lavish contentment and well-being enjoyed only by impecunious sybarites waking in the houses of the rich. So impecunious sybarites is, it's a beautiful phrase. It's a great example of Mel Larson's style. That means people who enjoy pleasure that's a sybarite, is a person who enjoys pleasure. And impecunious means without money. So Helga is an impecunious sybarite in the house of the rich. She wants money. But note the end of the passage. Always she had wanted not money, but the things which money could give. Leisure, attention, beautiful surroundings, things, things, 
things. And I wrote in the margin, aesthetic desire, a desire for beauty pursued almost as a spiritual quest. That's what Helga wants. Now, this there's an irony here. An irony is when something occurs that you don't expect. And the irony is that this idea that had been so often associated with European men who had independent means of support, so relatively wealthy European men, this idea that had been associated with them, when, a, when an African-American woman without money tries to take on these values, she finds that it's more difficult for her. Why? Well, because she's in a society that was largely set up for wealthy European men. It wasn't set up for um, relatively unprivileged economically African-American women. It tended to discriminate against or to oppress those uh, citizens, okay? And so one of the ironies of Helga's life is that her desire for aestheticism is defeated by a society that only allows white men to be aesthetes. And we see that clearly when she goes to Copenhagen because it says, let's just read this passage, it conveyed to Helga her exact status in her new environment, a decoration, a curio, which is a just a decorative item that's meant to be talked about, a peacock, uh, a kind of animal for display. So she wants to experience the world aesthetically, but when she goes to Europe, she finds that the uh, wealthy people of Europe want to experience the world aesthetically, and they want to use her as an aesthetic object. So the irony here is that she takes up this sensibility of aestheticism, and she does the things that aesthetes do. She, notably, she appropriates uh, work that she considers exotic from the East. She has her Chinese silk and her, or what's the phrase from the last uh, page, her Chinese carpet and her oriental silk, just as Ezra Pound appropriates the arts of Asia. And yet when she goes to Europe, what she finds is they see her the way she sees the cultures of the East, as a curious, exotic figure to be consumed and appropriated and used for their own benefit. So that's one of the ironies of her, of her life, one of the bitter ironies of her life, was that she thought she could be the hero of a story of aestheticism, where she would be the heroically visionary, artistic person taking on the whole world as her artistic object. But she finds that in a society set up, really, for white people, she's going to be not the hero of that story, but the object, the thing they take on, okay? So I know I began kind of with, with one of the more abstract themes of the book, but I'm just in a way following Nella Larson because that's the first thing she tells us about Helga. She's an aesthete, but her aestheticism is defeated when she finds that the role of the aesthete is difficult to occupy for somebody who belongs to a class that the people who created the role of the aesthete consider lower than themselves. All right. So why does this happen, though? Well, it has everything to do with gender and race, uh, as I just implied, that she can't be the thing she wants to be because the thing she wants to be is reserved for males and for white people in her society in early 20th century America and Europe. And so what we now need to explore is what the novel tells us about the racial and the gender ideology of early 20th century United, the United States and Europe. So I want to move on. Um, I'm going to skip that. I want to move on to this idea of double consciousness. And this will be the last thing I explain. You might be interested in the slide I skipped. I, I just feel like I'm running out of time and I want to make sure I can cover this whole novel in two lectures. 
just briefly, I hate to skip a slide. So one of the things that helps us to understand Helga's aestheticism in the novel is she's obsessed with clothes. And I think that this will, this will actually come back because it, it plays into the theme of race and race and culture in the novel. But I just want you to take note of the way that every single time we switch to a new setting, Nella Larson tells us what the people are wearing, tells us what Helga is wearing, and Helga thinks very deeply about clothes, just as she thinks very deeply about how to furnish her home. She thinks these outer manifestations of artistic taste are incredibly important. So fashion is part of the aestheticism theme, but it's also part of the race and gender theme because, um, well, you'll see, I'm gonna get to it. So with that, I want to, sorry for going out of order, I wanna turn to this idea of double consciousness. And this is the last thing I'll explain in today's lecture, and then we'll pick up right where we left off in the next lecture with the theme of race in the novel. So there's a thinker named W.E.B. Du Bois, an African-American philosopher and sociologist. He's named in the novel. There's a reference to him in the novel. And he was, he was alive and not very old at the time it was written. He wrote a very influential review of the novel, which is, I think, yes, quoted on the back cover of the Penguin Classics edition, in which he calls this book fine, thoughtful, and courageous. So he's very connected to this novel. He wrote a very famous book. His most famous book was written in 1903, and it's called The Souls of Black Folk. And it's a, it's a book in which he writes a series of essays about the conditions of African-American culture in the early 20th century. And one of the most influential formulations he develops in this book is the idea that African-Americans possess what he calls double consciousness. So I want to read you the passage about double consciousness from this book. Then I want to say it a little bit in my own words, and then I want to just tell you what it might have to do with the novel. So he says, and he's, he's writing again in the early 19th century, so he's using a language in which the world is divided up into several racial groups. And so he talks about the Egyptian, the Indian, the Greek, the Roman, the Teuton, that would be like the German the Mongolian, that would be like the East Asian, and then he speaks of the Negro, which is the African. So obviously we don't use these, most of these words anymore, and, and, and in fact some of them might be considered offensive if you use them today, but they were considered neutral terms when he was using them. So he says, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil, and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his Tunis, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So here's what I think he means. If we, let's ignore the first part where he speaks in these kinds of almost biologically racial terms, because he's a thinker that I think he, when he was at the beginning of his career, he spoke in those terms, but he understood, I think, clearly that race was not a biological reality, but was a cultural construct. And I think this passage actually goes on to explain race as a cultural construct. Here's what he means by double consciousness. Let's just go back to, you know, the, the, when he's writing, the early 20th century. So the condition in which African Americans find themselves is they were brought to the United States enslaved. And then after the Civil War, when, the, when slavery ended, there was a brief period in which the North uh, attempted to impose more racial equality on the South, the period of Reconstruction. But that was um, abandoned through a very, it's a very long story, and this isn't a history class, but it was abandoned in 1876. 
And then after 1876, there was the introduction of Jim Crow laws in the South, which was a system of formal legal segregation and oppression of African Americans. And this and, and Du Bois is writing just just in the midst of when that that great migration of African Americans to the north starts. But his point is this. African Americans live in a society where they were a minority group, so they didn't have the numerical majority. And the all the institutions of that society were formed in a period in which they were either legally enslaved or legally oppressed which means they're living in a society designed almost against them. And in order to survive in such a society, they have to be aware at every moment what that dominant culture thinks of them and how that dominant culture sees them. Why? Because in systems of legal enslavement and legal oppression, that's a matter of life and death. They have to fully understand what that culture that rules over them thinks of them. So when they think of themselves, Du Bois says, when African Americans think of themselves, they can't ever just neutrally think of themselves. They always have to have internalized what white people think of them. Because if they haven't internalized that, then they could somehow offend white people or white society and find themselves in danger. So they have kind of, in a way, how they see themselves, but how they see themselves always filtered through how white people see them. And I would argue that this is one of the main dilemmas Helga faces in Quicksand, is that she's never able fully to know what she wants because she's always seeing herself and judging herself through that white lens. And it's it's even more difficult in her case because she was raised by a white mother and her, her black father had left the family. And so she was raised sort of wholly within white culture and feels certain allegiances to white culture, such as her adoption of European aestheticism. And so, and there are passages in the novel where she meets other black people who think who hate white people and she's kind of in a way offended by that because she does see herself as being in some cultural way white as well as black so the issue of double consciousness is uh, we might say doubled for her or, or quadrupled for her because she has this rearing within white culture that gives her certain allegiances to white culture and so and also by the way one of the points of this book is you can't separate white and black culture, that these aren't sort of two totally sealed off things. So she's never able fully to experience herself as this kind of unified self. She's always seeing it through this other lens of what a dominant culture that judges her harshly thinks of her. And so with that introduction of the theme of racial ideology and the relation of culture to race, I will end today's lecture. I'm going to pick up right, uh, right there at the beginning of the next lecture, and we will look at how racial ideology and race and culture are, are portrayed in the novel. We'll move on to talk about um, how gender is portrayed in the novel, and then once you finish it, you'll see that we have to talk about how religion is portrayed in the novel and what that has to do with these other themes. And then... I'll have some final thoughts. So that ends today's lecture. I will uh, talk to you in the next one. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for your attention.